when it comes to physical fitness and spiritual fitness, we have to show up. Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. God wants us to show up daily, to humble ourselves before him, to surrender our ways, our will, our wants to him, to confess our sins to him, to spend time with him in his word, in prayer, in worship, so that we can live and love his way in his strength for his glory. God leads, I follow. Say that with me out loud. God leads, I follow. Thankfully, God helps us to follow him by faith, by the power of his Holy Spirit in us. Open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. We're continuing in our sermon series titled Fit Faith. We are identifying the spiritual disciplines that help us get in shape and stay in shape spiritually. As we study these disciplines, God will let us know which ones we need to make, renew, or increase in our lives. God wants each one of us to be spiritually fit. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, don't you know the runners in a stadium all race, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. God wants us to run the race of the Christian life that he has marked out for us in Christ Jesus. God wants us to live each day in the forgiveness, freedom, grace, and victory that is ours in King Jesus. And so we're continuing to look at how God makes our faith fit. Acts chapter 2, in verse 42, Luke wrote these words. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Before we go much further into our time together, let's look real quick at they devoted themselves to. When you see that they devoted themselves to, at the beginning of verse 42, they devoted themselves to is a verb, and it's in the imperfect tense, which means continual, daily, ongoing, repeated action. It means action that is occurring again and again. The Christ followers in the church in Jerusalem were devoted to the spiritual disciplines in God's workout plan. They worked out spiritually. They worked out their faith and trust in Jesus Christ day by day, week by week, month by month. And it showed. God's power was on display in their lives, in their ministries, and their relationships. What God did in them drew people to him. As we devote ourselves daily to the spiritual disciplines and God's workout plan in his word, God will display his power in our lives, ministries, and relationships. What God is doing in us will draw people to him. Just as it was happening years and years ago in the believers in this first church in Jerusalem, it is happening here with us in our fellowship uh, day in and day out. The first discipline that we see, this first spiritual discipline, and we've studied it a couple of weeks ago, is be biblical. He said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. God wants us to devote ourselves to the preaching and teaching of his word, which you are doing right now. You can pat yourself on the back. You're doing that right now. God wants us to devote ourselves to reading his word, studying his word, obeying his word, and sharing his word. The faithful preaching and teaching of God's word helps us understand God's truth. Be biblical. The second discipline is be relational. He said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship. Fellowship means community, partnership, sharing. We have fellowship with one another by faith in Jesus. Our fellowship is where God wants us to live out his truth. The preaching and teaching of God's word helps us understand God's truth. Our fellowship is where God wants us to live out his truth. God wants us, as we've been sharing the past couple of weeks, to be grounded and surrounded. 
God wants us to be grounded in his word and surrounded by his people. God wants us to rely on his word in our relationships. He wants us to live what we learn from his word day by day. And so we see how Paul then continues and says they devoted themselves, or Luke continues, so they devoted themselves to apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Here's where we begin to see a dual focus. The fellowship, these believers in the church in Jerusalem shared with one another in Jesus, emphasized meals, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. There was an inner focus. There was an inner focus to their fellowship. There was an inner relational focus to their fellowship. And their inner focus within the church family emphasized meals together, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. The inner relational focus of our fellowship in Jesus emphasizes meals together, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. Jesus was the priority in the fellowship in Jerusalem. Jesus is the priority of our fellowship here in our church family. Our faith is in Jesus. Our eyes are on Jesus. Our preaching and teaching is about Jesus. Our obedience is to Jesus. Our strength is from Jesus. Our witness is for Jesus. And our eternity is with Jesus. Jesus is the priority of our lives, our relationships, our ministries, our fellowship. And so we see we're going to be biblical, we're going to be relational. When we're relational, that means the fellowship. We're talking about relating to God first and then to one another and all those God places around us. So when we're talking about being relational, there's an inner focus and an outer focus. The inner focus Luke shared here in verse 42. Devotion to breaking of bread, devotion to prayer, devotion to fellowship. So we, we see and we understand inner focus. But there's also an outer focus. Being relational also has not only an inner focus, but an outer focus. And the outer focus leads us to our third discipline that God wants us to practice. It's how we exercise our faith in him. And that third discipline is be missional. The outer relational focus of the fellowship these believers shared in Jerusalem emphasized helping others come to know Jesus. Luke told us in verse 47, every day the Lord added to their number those being saved. They were missional. The outer relational focus of the fellowship that we enjoy in Jesus today emphasizes helping others come to know Jesus. God is changing each one of us in our fellowship, currently, even right here, right now, to be more like Jesus day by day. God is adding to our number those who are being saved. So it's our joy to tell people about Jesus. It's our joy to tell people the good news of the gospel. It's our joy to tell people about God's forgiving, freeing, loving, rescuing, transforming grace to us in Jesus. It's our joy to point people to Jesus. It's also our responsibility to point people to Jesus. Jesus commissioned you and me to be missional. He commissioned us to be missional. He commissioned us to not only the inner relational focus of our fellowship, but the outer relational focus of our fellowship. In Matthew 28, beginning of verse 18, Matthew recorded the words of Jesus. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus was clear. Go 
make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. We see the inner focus, the inner relational focus, teaching them to observe and obey everything I've commanded you. We see the outer relational focus. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Being missional shouldn't be difficult for us. I would suggest to us this morning that every one of us are missional in different ways. Every one of us quite possibly could have been missional this past week. Some of us, even as recently as this past weekend. So being missional from God's perspective shouldn't be difficult. What am I talking about? Well, this is what I'm talking about. When we find a good deal, when we see a good movie, when we eat at a really good restaurant, when we find a good sale at a store we know or a new store, we witness. Oh, we witness. We tell everybody, whether they want to know or not, whether they shop there or not, whether they like that type of food or not, we will even, at times, go to the next level and we'll say, we're going to take you with us. Come with us. Come on with us. It's so good, you're going to love it. Come on with us. There is no one and there is nothing more satisfying than Jesus. We witness with our words and our walk. We point people to Jesus we point people away from Jesus. Trust me when I tell you, and I know you would agree, but in case you're on the fence, trust me. People are watching us and people are listening to us. They are watching. They are reading. And they're listening. And what they want to know about us as followers of Jesus Christ is do their words, actions, and walk line up? Does it line up? D.L. Moody, late pastor and author, said this, the biggest argument against Christianity is Christians. The biggest argument for Christianity is Christians. The biggest argument for or against faith and trust in Jesus Christ is those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Putting a priority on being missional. Remember, consistency in our walk, our words, our actions, and our work is the goal for us. Not perfection in our walk, words, actions, and work. It's consistency. And so we see that inner focus is within the body, but now we're looking at the outer focus, being missional for you and me. This is what God's called us to. We see it all throughout his word, especially here in the New Testament, the book of Acts and beyond, as the good news of the gospel spread throughout the Roman world. It continues to spread today. It's spreading here with us, and it's continuing to spread throughout the world. So how can we be missional? Let's look at a few ways that we can be missional. Four ways in particular that you can be missional and that I can be missional, that we can put this truth into practice in our lives today and this week. We can take what the scripture teaches us, and we're going to give you some steps here that you can begin applying 
right now. You can make these commitments. You can renew these commitments. You can increase these commitments. For some, you're going to be able to take these commitments, and you are practicing these commitments. You're working out spiritually. You've got a fit faith. So then God's going to use you to take these commitments and minister to others to help them to have a fit faith. And so there's something for all of us here as we look at ways that we can be missional. The first way is pray. We pray for God to open the minds and hearts of those who don't know Jesus. We pray for God to give us opportunities to share the gospel with those who don't know Jesus. We pray for God to help us share the gospel clearly, confidently, and courageously. We pray for God to save those who don't know Jesus by his grace through their faith and trust in Jesus. We pray with one another and for one another to be missional. We pray with one another and for one another to look for and to take advantages of the opportunities God gives us to be missional. We pray the Lord continues to add to our number those who are being saved. We pray that God continues his work in us so that it can be seen through our lives. We pray for the invisible work of God to be made visible in and through our lives. If we're going to be missional, it starts with prayer. Now, this is a point that every one of us can practice. We can pray. We can pray for those that God's placed around us, those you work with, those you go to school with, those you live near, those in your family, those friendships that you've had for years and years and years. And you know that you know after having discussions with these folks that they have yet to receive God's gift of salvation by faith in Jesus. Don't give up. Keep persevering. Keep praying for them. Keep praying that God would open their hearts and their minds to the good news of the gospel. Pray, if they're not close to you, that God would put others around them who know Jesus, who could witness to them. Keep praying that God would radically save folks by his grace through faith in Jesus. And we can keep praying, especially for those that we know and love, who we know have yet to make that decision. The second we pray, the second way to be missional is prepare. When God answers our prayer, we need to be ready to share. It doesn't make sense to start the first principle and not move to the second principle. When we pray, God's going to answer our prayers. And so when we pray and God answers our prayers, we need to be ready to share. Now, there's two things we need to be ready to share. Number one, we need to be ready to share our story. We need to be ready to share our story. We are experts on how God saved us. You're an expert on how God saved you. I'm an expert on how God saved me. We are experts on the difference Jesus makes in us. We are experts on the love that we have for Jesus. We are experts on how Jesus has blessed us. So we need to be prepared to share our story. When others ask us, and when we get conversations, being missional means being ready and willing and excited to share our story about how God saved us. And secondly, we need to be prepared to share the gospel. We obviously need to be prepared to share the gospel. This means we need to be biblical so that we can know the truths of the gospel, so that we can know how to effectively share the gospel. So it goes back to being biblical. This also means we need to be relational so that we can stay close to Jesus who gives us the strength to share the gospel. We need to be relational so that we stay close to those who don't know Jesus so that we can show Jesus to them and share Jesus with them. So this third discipline can link up with the second and first disciplines. As I said before, the first discipline, biblical, is the foundation for all the other disciplines. And so as we're looking at being missional, we need to be biblical so that we know the gospel. We need to be relational so that we're focusing in on Christ who gives us strength to share and we're around those who we can share and show Jesus on a weekly, regular basis. And then we need to focus in on sharing 
the gospel. There's four main points when you want to share the good news of the gospel. There's four main points to stay focused in on. Now, as you're sharing, the Holy Spirit may lead you, and you may go deeper in one of these points. Folks may ask questions that take you in a little different direction. But if you'll hone in on these four points, if you'll focus in on these four points, these four points will be able to guide you in being missional. They'll be able to guide you in being prepared to share the good news of the gospel. They'll be able to guide you in being ready and prepared to share Jesus with those who need to know Jesus. The first point is we are sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. There is none of us righteous, no, not one. None of us have sought God on our own. We've all turned away from God in sin against God. We have all gone our own way. We have all said, thought, done, and desired things that are against God, unpleasing to God, and in violation of the word of God. We sin because we're sinners. It's who we are. We inherited our sin nature from Adam. And there are no exceptions. This includes all of us. For all means for all have sinned. And so this is the very first point. When we're talking about presenting the good news of the gospel, this links everyone. Everyone falls into this first category, which means we're going to fall into the rest of the points as well. There are no exceptions to point number one, and point number one leads all the way through point number four. The second point is not just that we are sinners. The second point is we need a Savior. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our sin against God, which we established in point one, separates us from God, and there is nothing we can do to get rid of our sin and get to God on our own. There's nothing we can do. There's no amount of good works that we can do that will ever make up for or erase the debt of sin we owe to God. Listen, let me make this real clear. Being good and doing good is good. Being good and doing good is not good enough. God's standard is not good. God's standard is perfect holiness and righteousness. God's standard never was and never is be good. It's be perfect. It's perfect holiness and righteousness. That's God. That's his standard. And so we need a Savior because what we deserve from God is justice for our sin against God, which means eternity in hell separated from God. That's what we deserve. We're all sinners. Our sin separates us from God. We can't get rid of our sin and get to God on our own. What we deserve for our sin is justice, which would be an eternity in hell separated from God. So we've got the first point, we're sinners. The second point, we need a Savior. Praise God, there's point three and four, amen? That'd be a rough, rough story if there was just two points. Point three, Jesus is the Savior. God loved us so much. He sent Jesus to earth to rescue us from our sins. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Paul said, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God did not give us the justice we deserve. No, he showed us mercy. He showed us grace. He extended love to you and to me. He loved us so much. He sent his son, our Savior, Jesus to this earth to rescue us from our sins. Jesus came to earth years and years ago, and he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus lived a perfect life. He met God's requirement for a perfect and holy sacrifice to be made for those of us who are imperfect and unholy so that those of us who are imperfect and unholy can be made right with the perfect and holy God, which only happens through the perfect and holy sacrifice of the Son of God, King Jesus. Jesus was tempted as we are, yet he never sinned. 
And Jesus died on the cross in our place, paying the price for our sins. He was buried in the tomb, and he rose again on the third day, victorious over sin and death for you and me. We have forgiveness with God by faith in Jesus. We are right with God by faith in Jesus. We have peace with God by faith in Jesus. We are children of God by faith in Jesus. We have fellowship with God by faith in Jesus. We are family with God by faith in Jesus. And so we see Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We're sinners. We need a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. He is the way and the truth and the life. There is no other way to God. There is no other way to a relationship with God than through faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Folks get all tied up and twisted today when you say there's only one way to God. And my response to that is always the same like many others. I can't believe there is a way. You're upset that you think that there's more than one way. I'm shocked that there even is a way. Because, oh, by the way, what we deserve is justice. We're helpless and hopeless. We're without God in this world. We don't have a chance on our own. We don't have a shot. And it is the epitome of pride to think there is some way we could somehow earn or get our way to God. No. We need to stop trying to find all these other ways and rejoice in the one true way, which is through faith in Jesus. And so we move to the fourth point. That fourth point is we believe in and receive Jesus by faith. Paul wrote in Romans 10, 9 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If it's with the mouth that you believe in are justified, it's with your heart that you confess and are saved. So we see and know and understand this is so important. We must believe in Jesus. What does that mean? It means we must believe Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he came to do. We believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And when we believe, then to receive this gift of salvation. We receive the forgiveness that Jesus provided for us with his blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. And we're able to be Adopted into God's family by his grace through our faith in Jesus. So we believe in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection for us, for our salvation. And then we receive God's gift of salvation as we repent from our sins. Repent means a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. It means under the conviction of God, we come to the end of ourselves and we realize our way's not working. So we turn from life our way and we turn to God and surrender to him because we want his way and his will for our lives. And so we repent of our sins, we confess them to God, we ask God to forgive us our sins and we place our faith and trust in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection for our salvation. We come before God and we claim the name of Jesus. We know that we know that we know the only way we are able to stand before God, the only way we have access to God is that we have been clothed in the righteousness, the perfect holiness of King Jesus for you and for me. We don't stand before God based on who we are, what we know, what we can do, what we have done, what we will do. We stand before God clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Paul told us, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. We surrender our all to him. So we are going to pray because we want to be missional. We're going to prepare because we want to be missional. God's commissioned us to be missional. And then third, we want to participate we participate. As followers of Jesus, we are witnesses for Jesus. Jesus made this clear to us in Acts 1.8. He said, for you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Say that with me out loud. You will be my witnesses. One more time. You will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we are witnesses for King Jesus. We don't get and opt out as followers of Jesus. We are called by God to tell others about Jesus. We are empowered by God to tell others about Jesus. We're witnesses for Jesus. 
That's not in question. The only question is, are we effective witnesses for Jesus? What kind of witness are we for Jesus? That's what's in question. That's what we're able to seek the Lord and allow him to search our hearts and minds about on a day-by-day basis. So we participate. Let's look at some ways we participate. Number one, if we're going to participate in being missional, we participate as we give. We give our tithes and offerings to God through the church so that we can fulfill the great commission together. Though not every one of us will be called to go to the nations to share the good news of the gospel with those in the nations, we are all able to go as we give so that those who are called to go are able to go. So we give and we support our missionaries as we just recently shared about. We support missionaries around the world through our giving that are taking the good news of the gospel to the nations. They're there now. We can't be there right now. They're there now. And we pray for our missionaries who are on mission for Jesus in the nations. We see here in this first church in Jerusalem, they gave generously to God and to one another. And God wants us to commit to give. One of the ways we participate is as we give. A second way we participate, we're able to be missional, is as we go. We can go to those who are close to us on a daily basis. We can go to those who are far from us as well through all kinds of amazing technology today. We can go to those close to us and those far from us. We have opportunities to be missional every day. Multiple opportunities to be missional every single day. We can do it as simply as smiling saying hello to people, shaking hands. When you're going through a checkout, when someone is waiting and serving you at your table, you can ask them how they're doing. You can ask them about what's going on in their lives. We can get information that we might be able to pray for them. We can ask them if we can pray for them as we pray to bless the food. We can be kind to others. We can bless others in Jesus' name in so many ways. It's so easy for us to be missional by going. Each one of us will have an opportunity here in just a few moments to go on mission to our brothers and sisters in Christ here to pray with one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to bless one another. We'll have opportunities to be missional as soon as we exit these doors, as we interact with those around us, those who are here that we may not necessarily be sitting by. We're going to have opportunities to be missional as we all go to lunch, as we go throughout our day, as we our life teams tonight. We're all going to have an opportunity to be missional throughout the week as we go where the Lord sends us to go, prepared and prayed up, so that we can do what the Lord calls us to do as he's sending us to go where he's sending us to go. And so it's so exciting for us. We go through being involved in our ministries on a weekly basis, through serving on Sundays and Wednesdays and our life teams and all kinds of different ways, all throughout the ministries throughout the year. We go as we minister to the community around us through our Dollar Day ministry, through our Cross Ridge Cares ministry. We go through opportunities to go on mission uh, to those countries where God sends us. We go each week. Every one of us has the opportunity to go by inviting folks, family members, others to Come to church. Come to church with us, knowing that they will hear the truth of God's word proclaimed, knowing that they will hear the truth of the gospel, and that God will be able to continue his work in their lives, whatever that work may be. And as we go, God uses us in his work in others' lives in amazing ways. This first church, as you see, They were committed to go, and God wants us to commit to go. As we are, he wants us to renew and increase that commitment today and this week to go 
to those he places around us. The third way we participate is we participate as we share. These believers shared the good news of the gospel. Look with me in Acts 4 and verse 12. Peter said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. He was sharing Jesus. If you look down in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 4, Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. He literally said, we're unable to stop speaking about Jesus. And then if you look in chapter 5, if you look over, after they were flogged and beaten, beginning in verse 40, after they called in the apostles and had them flogged, that's beaten. They ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and release them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Every day in the temple and in various homes, they continued preaching and proclaiming and teaching the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow. They kept preaching Jesus no matter what. They kept preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They kept preaching salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. They participated. They were missional. They weren't just giving and going. They were sharing. They were sharing every day in the temple courts, in their homes, wherever the Lord led them. And God wants us to participate through sharing. Again, we're praying And we're preparing so that we're ready to participate when God opens those doors. And that participation will include giving and going, but it'll also include sharing. Now, real quickly, let me just give you five points to remember as you share. Five quick points that I think will encourage you as you share. The first point is God loves those he places around us. So when you're praying and preparing and thinking about sharing, just know God loves those he places around us. He loves your bosses, your coworkers, your neighbors, your classmates, your teammates, your family, your friends. God loves those he places around us. Second, God is at work in those he places around us. He's at work in those he places around us because if for nothing else, he's placed them around us. We're his, we're his witnesses, so yes, he's at work in those he places around us because we're his witnesses, and he wants those who don't know Jesus to get close to those of us who do know Jesus so that we can be a witness for Jesus. So God loves those he places around us. God is at work in those he places around us. God wants to use us, the third point, is God wants to use us in his work in those around us. So he loves them, he's at work in them, and he wants to use us. In his work, in those he places around us, he wants to use us in his work in their lives. The fourth point is God is with us as we share. That's a great point. Point number four is a great point. And I would say it would be probably the top point if there wasn't a point five. But guess what? Point five is even better than point four. God is with us as we share. That's point four. Point five is real simple. We serve, we share, and God saves. God saves. We don't have to worry. We're not called or commissioned to save. That's not our responsibility. We serve others. We share with others. God saves. Salvation is his work, not our work. And the beauty is, since God is with us, as we share, and he's using us in those places around us, we oftentimes get a front row seat to watch God do his amazing work in others' lives, which is so encouraging for you and for me. Remember as well, we pray as we give, we pray as we go, and we pray as we share. So we're going to pray, we're going to prepare, we're going to participate when God gives us his opportunities. That means we're going to look for those opportunities and we're going to take advantage of them in the power of the Spirit of God living within us. We're going to pray and we're going to ask God if he's ready and, and wants us to move and then, and then we move. And then the fourth way that we're going to be missional is, is praise. We praise God 
that he is the one who saves. We praise God for how he has saved us. We praise God for how he is working in us. We praise God for how he is using us in his work and others around us. We praise God for opportunities to share. We praise God he is with us as we share. We praise God he empowers us to share. We praise God we are on mission for Jesus with Jesus. He is with us always to the end of the age. We're on mission for Jesus with Jesus. We praise God for the new, abundant, and eternal life that is ours in King Jesus. We praise God there is now no, no, no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We praise God that no one or nothing can separate us from God's crazy, amazing, incredible love for us in Christ Jesus. You see, the good news of Jesus is just too good to keep to ourselves. It's just too good. And listen, those who don't know Jesus yet are counting on us. Though they may not be able to communicate it or not, those who don't know Jesus yet are counting on us to show Jesus to them and share Jesus with them. They're counting on you, and they're counting on me. And so we want to make sure that we're ready. And then when the Lord opens those doors, we're prepared to participate and step through those doors knowing that we'll give all the praise, honor, and glory to the Lord. Harry Anside, a, a late Bible teacher, shared a story about a, a young man who had placed his faith and trust in Jesus. He was a new convert uh, to Christ, and he was uh, excited about his new life in Christ. And so this young man was given an opportunity to share his testimony at a church service. And so uh, with a smile on his face, with joy in his heart, he was elated. This young guy was so excited that he was going to get to share his testimony. And so he stood up and he shared his testimony. And he shared how God delivered him from a life of sin, of hopelessness, of loneliness. And as he shared his testimony, he gave God all the glory for his salvation. He didn't take any credit for himself in regards to his salvation. He finished his testimony, but before he was able to take his seat, there was a, a gentleman who was seated up in the front of the church. And this gentleman was very legalistic. There were some in the church who knew him, knew he was very, very legalistic. He did not understand, he could not grasp that salvation is by grace through faith and not by any works or merit on our behalf. And so before the young man was able to sit down, he raised his hand and he stood up and he said, excuse me, I want to ask you a question before you're seated. He said, you just shared in your testimony that God is the one who gets all the glory for your salvation. He said, but didn't you do your part before God did his part? And the young man smiled and with joy in his heart, he said, yes, sir, I did. He said, for the past 30 years, I've been running as fast and as far away from God as my sins could carry me. He said, but God, but God took out after me. He ran me down and he saved me by his grace through my response of faith in Jesus. What a testimony. Testimony that makes sense to me. And I'm sure in many ways 
make sense to you. Let's pray and let's prepare. Let's participate when God gives us his opportunities. And let's be sure to praise our Heavenly Father. Let's give him the praise that he is due because he is the one who has rescued us from the domain of darkness. He is the one who transferred us in the kingdom of the Son he loves. He has saved us by his grace through our faith in Christ Jesus. We have redemption through the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he showered on us in King Jesus. We can join with the psalmist who says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and your faithfulness. Let me ask you to bow in prayer. This is an opportunity for you and I to take these moments and let's just focus in on the Lord. It's not the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Our worship team is going to come and lead us in a response and our prayer partners will be standing here at the front. They'd love to pray with you, for you, over you. This is an opportunity for them not only to be biblical and relational, but this is a way for them to be missional. As they stand as witnesses for King Jesus who love you and who would love the opportunity to pray with you and pray for you. If you have a care, concern, a burden, a need that you brought into this room, I would encourage you to cast it on the Lord. He loves you. He cares for you. You could come up here and kneel at the altar. Husbands, grab your wife's hand. Wives, grab your husband's hand. Brothers, Grab a brother's hand, sisters, grab a sister's hand. Pray with one another. Pray for one another. Be a blessing. Be an encourager to one another. These prayer partners would love to pray with you, pray for you. We don't want anybody leaving this morning carrying the same burden they walked in with. But then let me encourage you as well. The gospel has been presented. And if you have yet to receive God's gift of salvation, then why not today? Why not right here, right now? Give your life to Jesus. He took your place. He paid your price for sin on the cross of Calvary. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He's alive. He wants a relationship with you. And let me just encourage you. If you find yourself in a very similar position as Jeff earlier through his obedience and baptism, I was able to share his testimony was he knew the Lord, knew about, a lot about the Lord. He knew a lot about the Word. He even served God in many different ways, but he always had doubts. He always had questions. He never had peace. He never was able to hold on to and to, to firmly understand and know that there had been a true life change. If that's you, then I want to encourage you to do the, the very same thing he did, and that's just to get it right. What a freedom, what a joy that comes over us when those doubts and those questions disappear. Why? Because the salvation that God brings to our lives when we once and for all surrender our all to the Lord. We lay our lives down. Worst team's gonna lead. It's our opportunity to respond to the Lord. Let's stand and respond in obedience today.